Welcome back to another episode of the Quillette Cetera podcast. You're with me, Zoe Booth. Today, I'm very excited to share with you a conversation with my mate, Razib Khan. Razib is a geneticist and co-founder of Generate, a deep tech company that deploys a platform for the life sciences. Okay, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what Generate does, but I know that Razib is an expert in genomics and I'm a very curious cat. So I use this opportunity to ask Razib pretty much every question I've ever had about genetics. Some of the questions are a little bit spicy. For example, are Ashkenazi Jews really native to the Middle East? Is Palestinian an actual ethnicity? Why do we all have different noses? And is nose shrinkage to blame for modern day snoring? Is incest actually bad for our genes or does it strengthen them? And why is studying genetics important? Isn't it a bit racist? Razib is not shy when it comes to answering these questions. He's contributed to Quillette a number of times, so he's not scared of getting cancelled. This is a very long intro and it's quite a long episode. It's about an hour, but I think you're going to love it. It's actually hilarious. And if you don't find it funny, there's nothing I can do to help you. If you do find it funny, please share it with your mates, please subscribe, and please check out quillette.com and become a member. Okay, without much further ado, let's get into it. The biggest question that many people are concerned about, are Jews indigenous to the Middle East? Well, I would say is they are more or less indigenous because it depends on the class of Jew, the group of Jew that you are talking about. So by definition, Iraqi Jews are indigenous to the Middle East. Uh, they've been there for 2,500 years. Uh, you know, their ancestors are obviously from Palestine. Um, there are other Jews in the Middle East, like Syrian Jews, have been there for pretty much ever, um, you know, 2,500 years probably as well. And uh, little of their ancestry is actually from Sephardic Jews that migrated from Spain. So just it's a little clarification. Uh, Yemeni Jews are genetically very similar to other Yemenis, except they don't have African ancestry. So Jews were not allowed to own slaves, so they don't have African ancestry. Um, so, you know, there's plenty of Jewish groups that are very numerous. Uh, Persian Jews, pretty famous group. Um, they mm -hmm. are obviously from Persia, from Iran. They're very similar to Iraqi Jews, but they're a little bit different. That indicates that they mixed a little bit with the Persian people, uh, the indigenous Persian so are people. All, although, are these all Mizrahi Jews? Um, Yemeni are not technically Mizrahi, and neither are the Syrians. They're, they're Sephardic. So Mizrahi Jews is, I think it's actually a neologism. It's a new word that people use for like Eastern Oriental Jews. So Iraqi Jews, Iranian Jew, Persian Jews, uh, Jews from Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, these Eastern Jews are Mizrahi. The Yemeni Jews are kind of in their own category. Uh, they've been there, you know, for like 1,500 years. There was a, a Jewish king of Yemen in the 6th century uh, before they were conquered by, uh, you know, the Muslim armies. And so they're indigenous to Yemen from what I can tell. Um, Syrian Jews, uh, they have Sephardic liturgy, so their religious tradition is Sephardic. That came in from Spain during the Ottoman period when a bunch of high-status Sephardic Jews left Spain. They went to North Africa, they went to Egypt, they went to Syria, they went to Greece, they went to what is today Turkey. And so they changed the culture of the indigenous Jews in many of these areas that are pre-Sephardic. Um, there's like I think there's like one Tunisian community that kept their own liturgy. But all the other North African Jews switched to the Sephardic liturgy if they had another liturgy. Um, in Turkey, the Jews there are actually pretty pure Sephardic because I don't think there were too many Turkish Jews. Whereas in Syria, there's a native Syrian tradition, a Syrian liturgy, an indigenous Middle Eastern liturgy that died off the 19th century. And it was totally replaced by the Sephardic liturgy. And so they all identify as Sephardic Jews now. In Greece, you have Greek Jews that are indigenous to Greece. They're called Romaniots. Um, the uh, tennis player Pete Sampras is part Greek Jew of that oh, group. They have but, their own uh, language, I think. Yeah, so they have, it's it's like Judeo Greek, right? Yeah. Can you just, can you move the mic? Just rotate yeah. it a bit so I can see your mouth. Okay, that's oh better. there you go. That's okay. better. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. we go. All Thank right. Um, so okay, uh, what about what about mm -hmm. um, the African Jews? Like you mean the Bet Israel, the, the Ethiopians, the Bet Israel? Yeah, they just look Ethiopian. They look like Tigray and. Um, I am on record. I don't have a strong confidence in this, but I do think that they are probably Judaizers. They're recent Judaizers, which may, which which I believe, which which to me, what that means is, um, I think that because like Ethiopian Orthodoxy has, uh, it has like a more Hebraic flavor than 
Like, first of all, it's associated with the Coptic Church in Egypt, so it's Oriental Orthodox. And secondly, uh, they circumcise, they avoid pork, and also they have a tradition of the connection between the Queen of Sheba, uh, who they associate with their country, not Yemen, and Solomon. And so um, the, the royal family for a long time was part of the Solomonic dynasty, and they claimed descent from King Solomon. And so the Ethiopian Christians, Orthodox Christians in the Highlands, feel a connection to um, to Jews, to you know uh, the, the Jewish people in that way. And um, I think that the Beta Israel, my personal belief is they probably are Judaizers, which happens among some Christian groups uh, where they just – basically go back to the Old Testament because they didn't have the Talmud. So the Talmud, uh, as a lot of your listeners will know, is what really defines rabbinical Judaism, the uh, Pharisaic Judaism that evolved, uh, you know, between 1,500, earlier than, you know, basically from around the time of Jesus and a little earlier down to about the 6th century AD when the Babylonian Talmud was put together, right? And so the Talmud defines a connection to worldwide, uh, the world Jewry. So the Yemenis, you know, the Iraqis, the Persians, they have the Babylon, they have the Talmud, right? A lot of the Indian Jews have the Babylonian, have the Talmud, um, but they don't, some of them do not. Um, and the ones that do not, uh, the Beni Israel, uh, genetically, they actually look like they clearly have Jewish ancestry, like about like 20 to 30% Jewish, like Middle Eastern ancestry. The rest of it's Indian. Sorry, what are they mostly- called? The Beni Israel, B-E-N-E. Beni. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the Beta Israel is Ethiopians. So the Beni Israel, yes. unlike the Beta Israel, um, they have clear Jewish genetic origins. Um, but the Beni Israel, like the Beta Israel, um, lost the Talmud. So they they had they had the Torah, but they lost the Talmud. The lo- loss okay. of the Talmud indicates that they were being assimilated. And there's some ethnography. I actually, I have a friend who studies studied them. There's a there's a strong uh, historical tradition that they were clearly being assimilated into the Hindu caste system and losing their Jewish identity uh, up until about the 19th century. And then Middle Eastern Jewish groups and also the Cochin Jews from Kerala and South India, who were always connected to Syria through trade, uh, not Syria, but like just the Levant and, and Iraq. Uh, they were Orthodox conventional Jews and they recontacted the Beni Israel um, and they brought them back to kind of like a stronger Jewish identity, if that makes sense. Um, all of the, the Hinduization that was happening to them just stopped and reversed. Um, with the Beta Israel, I think that that's more of a, a Judaization that happened where it was a particular Christian sect that was more Jewish, uh, even more than the average Ethiopian Orthodox. And then they got in contact with Jews in other parts of the world. And they thought, I mean, honestly, I think what happened is they do think they're Jews um, and they decided to shift their whole religious identity and their religion overall to Judaism. And they don't have the Talmud. When they arrived in Israel, they had the Tanakh, like, you know, they had like the written Torah, but they didn't have uh, any of the oral ta- the oral Torah. And so they've gotten that and assimilated to a full Jewish identity. But um, so I think that that's why genetically, though, they have no signatures of connection with Middle Eastern populations, which the Indian Jews do. Mm. And that indicates mm-hmm. that the Indian Jews are descended from a Jewish population that mixed with the people in India. And some of them retain their Jewish identity fully, like the Cochin Jews did, um, whereas the Beni Israel were becoming integrated into Hindu culture in many ways. Um, whereas the Beta Israel in Ethiopia are a new community that rediscovered a Jewish identity. But I think that that is kind of a historical innovation. Um, but they're obviously indigenous to Ethiopia, right? So do so. It's not necessarily true that all Jews, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, Beta Israel, have something in common. Yes, ethnically, although, genetically. Yes, although although um, most of them do seem to have something in common, even if it's not the majority okay. of their ancestry, and it tends okay. to go. And this is in contravention to Jewish law, which is matrilineal. But it tends yeah. to be patrilineal, um, you know, what's called the Cohen modal haplotype. It's a Y chromosomal lineage. It's a, a branch of J2. I think its mutation is P58. The genetics nerds out there who are Jewish will know what I'm talking about. This is a mutation that's uh, found in a lot of Jewish males. Um, it's found in some non Jewish males in the Middle East, too. Um, it's a Middle Eastern thing. 
but it's in really high frequency in Jewish males, and in particular among the Cohens. Uh, and the Cohens, as you know, are the priestly caste. They're descended, direct paternal descendants from Aaron, uh, supposedly. Is that proven? And, uh. Well, it could be. Um, the There's still arguments about it, but it looks to, you know, some people have estimated it's about 3,000 years old, which works out with the timing. But wow. whoever whoever they're descended from, they are descended from a common man. Wow. Right. Okay. Like the Cohens, the Cohens are mostly Cohen modal haplotype. That's why it's called the Cohen modal haplotype, right? It's found in other Jews, but it's Jewish males. It's definitely found in in Cohens. So the the Beni Israel, these Indian Jews, and if you look at them, they look mostly Indian, but sometimes you know your Jewish friends would be like, yeah, but sometimes their faces look a little Jewy, you know, like they look <laughs> maybe they're like part Middle Eastern, you know. Um, so you can kind of just tell looking at them that they're not pure. A lot of them that they're not totally Indian. But they mostly look Indian, and they experienced a lot of racism when they when they went to Israel, actually. But um, it turns out, so, yeah. So there is a there is a Jewish look because Jews are obviously very sensitive about that for good reason. Like, you know, mm -hmm. what does a Jew look like um, when there are so many different types? But you would argue that there is a look. Well, I mean, they're Middle Eastern people, so I mean, like, if you see mm -hmm. someone that looks Middle Eastern in Poland, what do you think their ethnicity is? No, they're Jewish, usually, right? Um, so, I mean, also Ashkenazi Jews look a certain way, mm -hmm. which is very distinct to them because they went through the, I think most people know this. I mean, you know, I have, yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of Jewish friends and I mean, they look a certain way because like they're genetic. And we can talk about the Ashkenazis later because we haven't gotten to that because those, those are the controversial ones, right? Like Bibi Netanyahu is Ashkenazi, right? Like they're the ones that are mm. causing all the troubles, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, I just mean like, you know, like these Beni Israel have clear Middle Eastern ancestry. Like you can see it in their faces. Right. They look like some of them look like Levantine people with browner skin. OK, but um, the, the, yeah. y, the, the real big tell was the Y chromosome. Like they have Cohen modal haplotype, mm. which is not found in the Indian subcontinent. Right. So that means that their ancestors were these male Jewish guys. Can we talk about that? Like, so face differences, a lot of it for me is about noses, right? Like. People sure. have such different noses. It's such a ethnic marker. Um, you know, the typical mm -hmm. Afri African nose is very different to my nose. So what's up with that? Like why? And mm -hmm. so many people snore these days, like in the West. I was wondering if our noses have shrunk um, and they shouldn't have shrunk. Or it the depends. Bone more um, like, yeah. a, lot of the, a lot of the snoring has to do with obesity and I oh, think yeah. also, I mean, I have allergies and so I snore mm -hmm. and like a lot of, a lot more people have allergies. And so what happens is I know way too much about this because I'm an asthmatic. Um, mm -hmm. So it basically what happens is your, your tissues inflame and so your nasal passage shrinks. Okay. So it's like my, I have an issue, like if I don't take certain types of antihistamines, but even if I do like, you know, people who listen to me on the podcast, they know I sound a bit nasal a lot of the time and it comes and goes, but mm -hmm. it's just because I have allergies, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but like yeah. I remember as a kid, we had like an indigenous educator come and he was like, look at my nose, see how my nose is different to yours. That's because I mm. can smell like my people evolved to hunt. And, sure, you know. sure. Is that well, you're true? Talking about, you're talking about Australian Aboriginals. Yes. Okay. Oh, they're very distinct people. So um, <laughs> this is not like the, the topic of the podcast and I don't really care, like, you know, <laughs> but uh, this is the... Uh, you keep you, this tracks with Quillette. What people say about you guys, you know. I don't know if Claire would hey, approve I'm just this line of in inquiry. Noses. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if Claire would approve this line of inquiry, but um, I mean, I know like off camera, if you move the camera, you'll see your caliper collection. But anyway, oh my um, god, <laughs> no. Um, so Australian Aboriginals are very uh, special because they never went through agriculture. So I, you know, I have some friends that have studied the um, the evolution of skeletons, and basically what you see is agricultural people um they just like lose a lot of their bone mass and so um australian aboriginal skulls and their features look a lot more like what people looked like before agriculture so european skulls from before agriculture like people that lived in europe the hunter gatherers um they don't quite like look, look like australian aborigines but like um they're um there's a robustness to it the teeth are bigger the brow ridges are bigger and this is just common with all pre agriculture with a lot of pre-agricultural people. So Australian Aboriginals, their skulls and their features, a lot of it actually look like what hunter-gatherer foragers used to look like. So, you know, they don't process the, – they didn't process their food as much, right? So it's like we are mm -hmm. descended, both of us, 
are descended and like you know i mean you're half greek so you're you're really but i mean actually probably about the same amount uh we're descended from people that have consumed gruel for thousands of years okay so it's like whether it's and like keep uh, that tradition alive yeah wheat gruel rice gruel <laughs> um you know whatever millet gruel but i mean that's what peasants say they basically ate gruel a lot of the time and you know gruel's like it's moist it's mushy so you don't need like the big i mean yes it can be a little bread can be rough you know but you don't need like the big jaws you don't need the big teeth uh basically even aside from the genetics uh the inheritance stuff um also like you use your jaws a lot less so they'd look less prominent mm -hmm. but basically australian okay, but Aborigines, what about the nose yeah so you want to go back to the nose. Um, so the nose, uh, there is work on the selection uh, of the nose. So it does look like uh, – so, for example, Neanderthals had huge noses. Um, and the, huge, the huge this way or this way? or, or... Both. Both. It was okay. like just big. And so their wow. faces would jut out. And the theory is it's because it would moisturize and heat up the air. Um, and, really? and, it, and like people from like, uh, you know, really dry, hot desert areas, like uh, people from Arabia – they tend to have like these long noses again to have to do with okay. moisturization. So but, it makes uh, sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Europeans is kind of similar, but Europeans it has not to do with mo moisturization. It has to do with uh, heating it up, right? And so these right. like long, thin noses. Um, there is evidence genomically that they're at they're they're adaptations to particular type of uh, particular type of climates uh, that have occurred. And so the mm -hmm. Middle Eastern noses, obviously, you know. Uh, like the Jewish nose is not only a Jewish nose. It's also an Italian nose. It's also an Arab nose. You know what I'm saying? Like these like long, larger noses are very common in a lot of people. And it's probably to, you know, heat up or like moisturize the air to make it more, you know, once it gets to your sinuses okay. and inside of you. And what about the flat, wide nose? Yeah, I, I forget what the reason for that is, but that tends to be more common in wet tropical climates. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah, like Southeast yeah. Asia, Asia, Africa. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, and I forget what the reason of that is, but um, and you know, also, um, I just am going to turn the light on. Yeah. Okay. Do continue. Yeah. So, um, also, I've actually talked to geneticists about the fact that, um. Some variation in facial features and noses and things within a population are actually probably useful for the reason you pointed out earlier in the conversation. Um, if everyone looks exactly the same, it's probably not optimal. Um, you probably want to be able to identify people in your tribe or in your clan um, besides just – I mean, for example, if you need to identify people by their voice, well, you might not want to talk all the time. There might be mm -hmm. something going on where you want to keep quiet. And so um, physical, there is some evidence that we maintain more physical diversity in our features than you would just expect randomly. And so that basically means there's, mm. it's, it's called balancing selection in the genetic parlance. And so it basically means that like, there's a diversification element uh, to, um, to our physical features that probably have to do with identification. Just like, you know, certain organisms, they have like spotting. And the spotting varies, and the, the variation obviously is camouflage, but it's also um, could be useful in identification for people mm -hmm. or not people, but like you know organisms in your set or mm -hmm. not in your set. So identify yeah. who's in group and out group and these sorts of things. Whereas yeah. like you know if everybody if everybody in Germany had the exact same nose and the mm -hmm. exact same face, mm -hmm. I mean obviously you're going to be able to kind of figure out who you're related to, but it starts to get a little ridiculous when everyone looks the yeah. same and you got to look at people closely yeah. and stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because some groups do look, have such a distinct look. For example, I can always tell Ethiopians from other African groups. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, or, yeah. Yeah. Like they just, if you, if you know, you know, they look so different. Um, but, um, so it's not wrong to think that some groups of people, you know, there's that stereotype that white people think that all Asians look the same. I've heard that lots of Asians think. Oh yeah, they totally look do. The same too. They totally but is do. Is it true? Is it true that some groups look more homogenous than others? Yeah, I think it is. I, I think East Asians definitely look more homogenous. I think. I think there has been evidence. I think they've looked. Uh, they do. I mean, like, think about it. Like, Europeans have different hair colors. 
Hmm. Uh, the we nose, mixed more, right? A little, they're a little bit more genetically diverse. That is true, uh, although not that much. Uh, I mean, hmm. I think I, I don't know what it is, but there is something with East Asians in particular where their variation is very um, low. I think in the hmm. facial features area. But also like even in like many blondes or redheads. Well, also yeah, also in pigmentation, they, there's a narrow range of they're not like super dark, they're not like super pale, right? There's a range that's very narrow, and then like in terms of hair, like, um, so I had um I had an engineer working for me once, a Chinese engineer, and I was like we were talking about hair and stuff like that, and he's like yeah he went to college, um, engineering college with a guy that they nicknamed Curly Curly, and uh, that's because he had curly hair, and so I was like wow. you you can see how curly my hair is right um. You know, my curly hair. And so I was like, oh, is his hair as curly as mine? I was just joking. He's like, oh, no, your hair is way curlier. So. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, it's very yeah. rare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so. why do, why do, Afri is it African people, only African people that have those tight curls? Or not just African? No, no, but, no, no. You know, uh, the Andaman Papua Islanders. New Guinea. Yeah, yeah. So some, a lot Pacific. of Melanesians yes. do, not always. Yeah. Nobody knows why. If I had to bet, I think that is the ancestral type, because um, people from the Andaman Islanders or Papua New Guinea people, they're they're not there's they're from the exact same one thousand people as everybody else outside of Africa. Um, so I think that's probably the ancestral type. Um, that sort mm. of hair. Um, How there many is types some are there? Uh, with a hair form, well, so hair the way you define hair is actually just like how tight the curl is, right? So it's a quantitative trait. Like, yes, we classify it as straight, wavy, and stuff like that, but all of it is is like how tight the angle of the or how tight the curl is. And so, people with kinky hair have really tight curls, that's really what it is. Um, Khoisan, uh, the Bush San Bushmen have tighter hair than other Africans, and it looks like they have like peppercorn like curls, it's because it like curls even more and like creates these like ringlets and stuff like that in their mm -hmm. hair. Um, and it's defined I, by, yeah. I have so a question saying... about the Khoisan because, so my friend, because they're from South, South Africa, right? Or yes. like, I say well, South, South Africa, Africa Namibia, Namibia yeah. Botswana, area. Khoisan, yeah. yeah. I sound v very like colonialist, South Africa. Um, so my mate, uh, Tesheni, she's from Zambia. And mm -hmm. she said that when she was at school, she used to get teased. They were like, you look like a Khoisan because she had this like really sort of bodacious body, like a big butt and thighs. Oh, you mean yeah, yeah, other girls. Yeah. And so okay, like, again, <laughs> this tracks with Quillette's reputation. These what questions like you're asking. Big, big booties. <laughs> I'm interested yeah. in butts. African and Mediterranean women seem to have more fat on their lower half and like yeah, yeah. European I mean, so, women yeah, yeah, yeah. have fatter I mean, it, upper bodies. The, the, so I think one thing that that's, um, that's true is like selection happens, but you know, this is, a, this is a saying, I don't know who said it originally, but selection is stochastic, which means there's a random aspect to it. So yeah, women, like some, some races of women, okay, like, like, I don't know, I feel really weird talking about this, but whatever, I'll go with Why? it. <laughs> because some the race of the women. Well, some, well, I mean, I'm not going to talk about guys' bodies because, like, sorry, like, you know. But uh, uh, some races I, oh, of I'm going to ask. Okay. okay so okay, some that's races up of women, um, you know, they lay, they lay fat, like, on their thighs, you know, or, like, you know, around the breasts or whatever. And mm -hmm. other races lay fat on their – you know, they're just preferential. What you're talking about the Khoisan is true, but I think other African people are like that too. They're just more extreme. And, like, you can just Google pictures. I mean, anthropologists were really interested in – you know, so there's something called like the Venus of the Koi Koi. Anyway, so the, the, yes, this is like famous. They're famous for like having extremely large butts for the rest of their body size. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's obviously where it's stored. But, um, you know, other peoples have different preferences uh, of where it's stored. And so I think like the fat's going to be stored somewhere. Like women have higher body fat than men, all things equal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like the question is where are you going to put it? Right, some races have fat. I put mine like, in my for, brain. Well, so yeah, you do need fat in your brain. Um, so for example, like one reason that people of South Asian origin have such high risk of type two diabetes is because we tend to store, like, we tend to have like a lot of like midsection and visceral fat. Um, so we're not a b big butt race, you know. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't like confirmed this myself in detail, but I've asked around uh, to to those who are interested in this. And they're like, yeah, like brown people are not a big butt race, which is bad no. because 
it probably would be better to have the fat in the butt um, because of the inflammatory response around your viscera, you know? Mm. But also, like, if you look at, uh, like, if you look at, like, those erotic uh, sculptures and stuff in, like, central India, Mm -hmm. um, it's quite clear uh, what the preferences of Indian men uh, thousands of years ago was, and it was not for the butt. It was for another, it was for two other things, you know? And that is actually still tracks with modern Indian preferences. Boobs and? Yes. Just boobs. The two boobs. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, but like Pornhub did some research. Pornhub did some research. And, you know, in India, people still look for boobs. In a lot of the other parts of the world, the U.S. shifted from boobs to butts in 2010. It's a generational thing. When I was Confirmed. growing up, no one cared about butts. No one cared. Yeah. When I was growing up, we had, I had a friend. Um, his name, he's deceased, so I can say his name. Um, he died of, uh, anyway, uh, vaccination, actually, uh, anthrax vaccination wow. when he joined the Marines. But, um, so Dan, Shit, Dan was a butt sad. guy. I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah. Sad. But uh, Dan was a butt guy. He's a white, <laughs> he was a white guy. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He was a white guy, but this is like, I grew up in Oregon and like, you know, he'd be like, you know, watching some music video. He was like, look at her butt. And I'm like, but so it's a generational That's thing so in the funny. United States, you know, but then in other cultures. Have you changed their mind? You know, I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> no, I haven't, but I I'm not going to talk it about out. it. No, I'm not going to talk about it. No, yeah. No, I, no, no I'm the I, same. I refuse, I'm, I'm, I refuse I'm, to speak to boob men. As a butt woman, <laughs> I, I refuse to speak to boob men. Well, no, I'm both. Uh, so. Anyway, no. Whatever. You know what? I'm not going to talk about this. Anyway, let's just change, change the subject. Because <laughs> like, I'm okay, going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble. So, um, yeah. So, like, okay. these sorts of things. So, yeah. Well, that's that's why do some races of women have bigger boobs? You know, the sexual, like, selection stories, blah, 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 they're all out there. But, I mean, look, we know we know that anatomically you do not need very large breasts to produce milk. So it's not functional. So what's it showing? Mm-hmm. It's showing that you have fat, that you're fertile, that you're nubile, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's an evolutionary psychological story. I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, but I can pretend to be just like every other human being in the world, you know? Especially on <laughs> Sorry. Twitter. But you, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Sorry, Jeffrey. But yeah, so I mean, I think it's, that's where it's displayed, right? That's where, like, the female mm-hmm. nubil- nub- nubileness, like, sexual, like, you know, reproductive value is displayed mm-hmm. that way in some populations. In other populations, it's displayed in the butt, you know? Is Palestinian a race or ethnicity? And what's the difference between a race and an ethnicity anyway? Yeah. So, I mean, these, so these are semantics though, you know? So a lot of the arguments are about what's a race and a, what, I mean, cause, cause populations are much fuzzier than, um, generally are much fuzzier than say like sex. Okay. Sex is relative. There are intersex people, but male and female, they're their overwhelming majority. Right. But when you're talking populations, there's variation. Where do you do the... There is obviously genetic differences. Obviously, people look different. If you see a Sweden and a Nigerian, you can tell, you know? But, like, where do you draw the line? I'm blind. Okay, well, but, yeah, but you're not nose blind. You're just, like, you know, you're not butt blind. I mean, so you have other characteristics that you're looking at, you know? Um, True. So, I mean, uh, that's basically – I mean, the ancient Greeks, by the way, uh, you know, they were pretty sophisticated uh, in their taxonomies. So – you know, they had like these different categories for different populations and they would say like, you know, I don't know if it was Aristotle or Herodotus, but one of them was like, did this taxonomy and they were like, oh, the people in uh, the most populous country in the world is India, which is, you know, uh, at the eastern edge of Asia. They obviously didn't know about China. So this has to be Herodotus or Aristotle because that was China was like during the Roman period, they realized that there was something there. And then they said, he said, but in the north, the people look like Egyptians. And in the south, the people look like Ethiopians, except they do not have woolly hair. So, I mean, they knew exactly yeah. like how to categorize, you know what I'm saying? Like, they knew the people in the south mm-hmm. were darker and they kind of looked like they were, they were Ethiopian colored, but they had straight hair. You know, so I mean, it's like the ancient people like had like a quite sophisticated understanding of these sorts of things. But um, anyway. So uh, it's Palestinian. yeah. yeah. A distinct um, so, group from other Arabs. Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. I mean, like, I've looked at the data. Um, I can tell a Palestinian from an Iraqi. It's harder to tell a Palestinian, a Lebanese, and a Syrian apart. But yeah. there are differences or there, Jordanian too. Jordanian or... Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, Jordanian... Again, a lot of this geography... So Jordanians mm. 
there are Palestinian Jordanians and native Jordanians. Native Jordanians are more like people who are Arabian, like Arabia proper. You know, Arabs of Arabia are different than, say, Arabs from Morocco, who are just Arabicized people mostly. They're people just adopted Arabic as a language, but genetically right, so they're, they're like, like Berbers. Bedouin, they're Berber. Right. Yeah. yeah Berbers, no, the ancestors yeah, were okay. Berber, right? Their ancestors were Berber, yeah. and then they switched to Arabic relatively recently. And there's still a minority of people who are Berber in the High Atlas and stuff like that. So geography is a very good predictor. Also, you can tell if someone's a Palestinian Christian or a Palestinian Muslim pretty easily because the Muslims will have a little bit of East Asian or African ancestry because they had slaves and they intermarried with their slaves. Hmm. Whereas the Christians did not own slaves because they couldn't because they were demies. So they were not allowed, allowed to own slaves. Right. So, the, so the Christians look like people in the Levant look in terms of genetically, you know, before the rise of Islam. And so um, in the piece uh, that I think you were alluding to uh, about uh, uh, about Palestinian and Jewish genetics, I'm just going to say the whole mm-hmm. title. So it's actually a pretty popular mm-hmm. – it's like the third most popular uh, post that I have on my Substack. This now. is more than kin, less than kind. Yeah, Jews and Palestinians as Canaanite Great cousins. Piece. And so basically oh, – okay. um, yeah. Uh, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna explain real quick here is like when you look at Palestinian Muslims, uh, they can seem very distinct from other some other Middle Eastern groups like Palestinian Christians, and it's because African ancestry is very distinct. Okay, so it's like if you're ten percent African, um, that's like ten times as distinct as if you'd be I don't know ten percent Iranian. Okay, and so a little African ancestry will shift you in the genetic spectrum a lot. But 90% of your ancestry could be just like Palestinian Christian, okay? A Palestinian Christian has very little African ancestry. It has a little bit. Palestinian Christians as well have some African, sub-Saharan African ancestry from, say, the Roman period or earlier, but it's not that much, okay? And so they're much more like the samples that we get from the Bronze Age. So the ones I'm thinking about are the 1800 BC samples from Sidon in southern Lebanon. Um, those, are, those are Canaanites. And the ancient Hebrews were Canaanites. So Hebrew is a Canaanite language. It is a – it is because we have other Canaanite languages like Phoenician that we have like fragments of. We have no narratives of the Phoenicians, but I think we have uh, – we have their ledgers, right? So we have their accounting books, so we know Phoenician words and stuff. Phoenician is a Canaanite language. Hebrew is clearly a Canaanite language. The ancient Israelites are a branch of the Canaanites. So when you read the Bible and you're talking about the Israelites versus the Canaanites, the Israelites themselves were Canaanites, okay? Um it's not like it's not like uh, they could they could not understand each other. They were speaking the same language, right? So they made distinctions in the customs that they practiced, the god they worshipped, or the gods they worshipped. But they were actually of the same broad cultural people, and so genetically, and do um, do Ashkenazim yeah. come from Canaanites? They do too, as well. They do. So forty percent of the ancestry of Ashkenazi is Middle Eastern. Okay. Okay. And all, um, basically all of that looks like it's ancient Levantine ancestry. That's what I can tell you. Now, we don't have like Jewish samples. I mean, we have like a couple of Philistine era samples and stuff like that. But we don't have like that many Jewish samples from 2000 years ago in the Roman Empire, right? So we can't like say for sure, oh, like these are from Israel or Palestine of that period. But it's awful suspicious that they're Levantine. You know, they clearly look like people from Syria, Lebanon. Or, you know, Israel, like Palestinian Christians or Samaritans, like about 40% of their ancestry. That's the best model we have. 60% of their ancestry is European, whether it's like Northern Italian ancestry, that's about like, say, 50%. And then the rest of it, like a 10%, is probably Slavic. So that's converts. Yeah. um, Yes, yes. Um, Although, like, yeah. um, Yeah, I mean, it is converts, although I would be... I would suspect that a lot of these women, I'm not sure if they really converted in their life. You know what I'm saying? I'm, you know, I'm going to say right. they're just women, right? Like in a lot of these cultures, mm. you know, you raise the kids with the, but, with the identity yeah. of the father. But Jews do seem to be so particular about it, and I get why. Like I get why it's difficult com- to convert, um, and I get why yeah. they so sort that's, of keep that's it in more Christian, pure. That's in Christian and Muslim context, and that's because those two religions – made a rule that if you converted to Judaism, that's a capital crime, right? Oh, I thought it so, was I mean, because Christ- Jews want, I thought it was just a, a practice that came from the inside of Judaism. Not that- no, 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 no. So ancient, like yeah. Jews in the Roman empire before Christianity became normative, had, a, there was a lot of proselytes, 
But you, so you can read like, um, you can read in the Talmud. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've not read much mm-hmm. of the Talmud, but I've read like books mm-hmm. that are commentary on the Talmud. There mm-hmm. are like rabbis whose dad was like a proselyte, right? It was like not uncommon mm-hmm. to have someone whose father was a convert and presumably mother. Again, women are not mentioned as often, um, but conversion happened in the Roman Empire. This was a known phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm reading Dominion at the moment by Tom Holland. Okay. And it's given me some context for that. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, the whole, the theory is Christianity became popular because it required no circumcision and no change in things like, you know, eating pork. So it's like a way to become Jewish without becoming Jewish. Whereas to become a Jewish, it did require circumcision. It did require, uh, it did require changing, you know, with the, the ritual, ritual, the ritualism, the law. Uh, but there are a lot of people who clearly did it from the records, from the Jewish records themselves. What happened with Christianity was, um, and St. Augustine wrote about this. They did not forcibly convert the Jews because the Jews had the old law and, um, you know, Christianity decided that the new covenant did not necessarily supersede the old covenant. Well, okay, this is like a theological argument. I don't want to get into it. But basically they said, we'll let the Jews be who they are because they're going to convert eventually because like they're going to come to the, you know, realize the error of their ways. They're a witness to, to the old covenant. Right. So but um, Christians could not become Jews. Um, there were people who did become Jews. They got they got burned. Or they fled to, say, like, Islamic Spain. Like, we know the Judaizers that survived and wrote uh, were in Islamic Spain, where the Muslims didn't care if a Jew became a Christian or a Christian became a Jew, right? Because, like, as long as you didn't become from Muslim to Jew or Muslim to Christian, they didn't care. And, but mm-hmm. in the Christian, Christian areas, you could not become a Jew if you were a Christian. And so there were laws about Jewish men having female Christian slaves. They were banned. Because they knew what would happen if a man, if a merchant has a female Christian slave, like what's going on there? You know what's going mm. on. And it was, and they would they would kill the man, and they would kill the you know. Well, I don't know if the woman would be killed, but basically they would punish the Jews. So the Jewish community has extremely strong incentive not to take converts, but they can take converts from pagan communities because Christians don't care about that. Yeah, mm. and so I think I think. <laughs> what's really happening with the European women, I suspect a lot of them were from either like nominally Christianized rural areas or for the Slavic people. I think that those were probably like just pagan women that were assimilated Mm. into the Jewish community because Christians don't care if pagans become Jews. Like Christians probably think it's better to be a Jew than a pagan, you know? Yeah. Bad to bad. And is it correct that Jewishness is passed on matrilineal, through the mother, is, yeah. I mean that, that because is the, because that way they could prove that someone was a Jew. Well, yeah. so um, the explanation that I've had, I've read about this that is most persuasive to me is that the Jews actually just, uh, yeah. I mean, but they actually just took on the Roman law, and so the Romans oh. had this particular law of matrilineal uh, ancestry. Basically, both your parents uh, had to be citizens. Your mother had to be a citizen. Um, because uh, Roman uh, uh, soldiers in the Roman legions, they they were not supposed to marry initially. I mean, eventually they allowed it later on, but initially they were not supposed to marry until they retired. And so, but they often, they always had girlfriends, you know, wouldn't call girlfriend, but consorts, concubines, whatever. Um, and they had children with these con- consorts. So, uh, yeah, but so that if the, if the, if the mother was not a citizen, they were not citizens. And so that means they couldn't inherit if the father died. Right, and so there was like a very, very strong material incentive not to enfranchise uh, children from Roman citizen males and non-citizen females. So the rule was, mother's got to be a citizen. You know, um, eventually that everyone became a citizen, and that all changed. But my point is, the Romans had a norm of the maternal thing, and the Jews apparently picked it up in the early um, in the in the Roman period. Um, yes, and it's it's a convenient way to track. But this was still a very mm-hmm. patrilineal society, and we know mm-hmm. from the Radhanites and other groups that they intermarried. Uh, because like in India, there's records like there's like white Jews and black Jews and black Jews are the ones that are descended from Indian slave women uh, that married the merchants in China. Um, again, they married Han Chinese women. So the Jews of Kaifeng in the 19th century, um, you know, like the rabbi's son was married to a woman who had like pigs in the house because she was Chinese. And it was like super embarrassing when Europeans showed up because they were just like, wait, you're Jew, right? And they're like. Kind of, you know, <laughs> it was like it was awkward because they were like they knew technically because the Chinese didn't know the Chinese actually couldn't tell the difference between a Jew and a Muslim. So, um, 
And mo- most of them probably did convert to Islam, actually, eventually. Wow. Very interesting. So. Okay. And when people look at me and they say, you don't look Greek, I tell them that Greeks are actually quite fair. Is that true, historically? Well, I mean, there's variation. Um, I'm mm. actually, I've looked a fair amount at Greek genetics. I did a post on it and... <laughs> it's I mean, been like um, Cytherian in particular, right? Where my family, yeah, yeah, from. Well, so, And I have yeah. so my friend Nick, who you know, mm. is what is born there. Uh, your cousin, mm-hmm. like I think he's literally your cousin, right? <laughs> Probably, mm. yeah. And so, um, and he's not very dark either. But um, so the issue with Greece is that um, as as people in Greece know, um, the, after the fall of well, not the fall, but basically around 600 AD, uh, the border uh, with the interior Balkans disappeared, and Slavic tribes just poured in. And they went, they went all the way into the islands. Like they went as far as Crete because you can see the genetic heritage there. So there's a range, um, some, some, especially in Salonika and in the north uh, and in Greek Macedonia. Uh, some of those, because I've met, um, like I met, like I have a friend, he's married to a Greek woman from Salonika and she has these bright blue eyes and she's very fair, but her hair and like her hair is auburn, but it's curly in a way that a, I've never seen on a Slavic person. So she's kind of like, a mix of a Greek person with a Slavic person. She's from Salonika. She she admits it. She's like, yeah, like it's clear that a lot of people in her family that her family is part Slavic and ancestry, right? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, some of these people were speaking. Um, there there are people who were speaking Slavic languages in Greece and like Peloponnese as late as 1600s. Like European visitors that went into the Ottoman Empire met some of these people, and so they were they were Hellenized. Um, and so modern Greeks are about like. 10 to 30 percent slavic in the north they're Mm -hmm. about 30 percent and then in the islands they're about 10 percent there's an exception to this um as i'm assuming your listeners and viewers because they're very well educated know um in the 1920s a bunch of greek people were kicked out of turkey greek-speaking people okay Uh, or they were orthodox christians who spoke Turkish. anyway but whatever they're called greeks okay so they come from various places some of them are the pontic greeks uh that was like a whole community uh in the black sea Uh, some of them from cappadocia um, there's like actually Greek church fathers called the Cappadocian fathers. So it was a huge Greek community there. They all were kicked out. Okay. They were all kicked out into Greece. These people show up genetically. They're quite distinct because they have no Slavic ancestry because they're Anatolian Greeks. And that part of the Byzantine empire was never subject to Slavic migration. Right. So the irony here is, um, it could be argued that the Greeks that are coming back from Turkey are more quote pure Greek than the ones that lived in you know the Hellenic state because the Hellenic state was basically except for like during during the peak of the Slavic invasions what basically the Byzantine Empire decided to do and I wrote I wrote a post on this about the Balkans what they decided to do is basically they just abandoned the whole Balkans they focused on Anatolia on Turkey Syria you know their possessions there um, and and Armenia and they just held Constantinople and the area around Constantinople. Sparta, a few other fortifications, the Peloponnese and Athens and Salonika and a few spots in like south of Albania and the, all that, the coast. And they just let the interior go like savage. OK, like basically they let the interior go post-apocalyptic. Um, like people, you know, people were just like they went like really crazy in the interior uh, in terms of like forgetting literacy, like, you know, devolving, like cities disappear. Uh, the Slavs hmm. show up and they have to re-Christianize everybody and all this stuff. Um, it just, it, it was, it was pretty bad. Um, once, once the Byzantines, uh, got, got their footing after the early Islamic invasions, they decided to reconquer the whole Balkans. And so, yeah, they had to reconquer the whole Balkans. They had to Hellenize the people. They actually settled Greeks from Anatolia in parts of, of modern Greece because it, they were totally like Slavicized. There were no Greek speakers left. Right. Uh, so this was a whole thing and this is going to get me in trouble with a bunch of people in Greece, but I don't care. You know? <laughs> I don't know. People are always like, oh, people are going to freak out. And generally, most people are pretty chill. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. You know, most people are like, yeah, they kind of already knew. But it, like, even if they, you don't say it, but I'm just like, look, yeah. I'm just like, look at your face. Like, look at your face. Yeah, I don't know why it's, why it's so offensive to talk about race. I think it's so interesting. And well, I mean, obviously, I mean, look yeah. at you. I mean, I mean what, what's been going on here? You know what I'm saying? It's like, I mean, you, you're trying to get me canceled for like the first time in 2024. That's fine. I'm due. You know, but. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, so in the future, are we all just going to be a mixed blob of everything? No, uh, because uh, the future is the past. So the past is also mixed and we're not a blob. So 
So what it is, basically, mm. I mean, I've written some posts on this in the past, like not on my sub stack, but on my blog. I, it's like, I, I don't think I can write a post on this too easily because I think it's a little technical for a lot of people. But anyway, um, basically, um, genetics is discrete, which means things rearrange, they don't mix, if that makes sense. And so if you just mix everyone together, what you're going to do is like get new combinations, not like a mishmash. So for example, um, I have a friend, um, I have a friend and she is a fourth Russian and three fourths Chinese. So her, her, her dad is a uh, Manchurian Chinese, but her dad's dad was a Russian. I think he left during the revolution. Okay. Her dad, so his grandfather or something, or, or no, he was like the child of people that, cause I don't think he was like born in 1918, whatever. So he, there's a Russian community in Manchuria, a small Russian community in Manchuria of white Russians. Okay. Um, and they're just, now in the 21st century, they're just disappearing because they just intermarry with the Chinese. But anyway, her dad's, her dad's, her, her paternal grandfather was a white Russian, like literally a white person, but white Russian from Manchuria. So she looks mostly Asian, um, but, um, you know, you can suddenly tell that she's of like some exotic, quote, heritage. But I'm telling you this story because she married a white guy from America, just a generic looking white guy. And so they have kids. And, uh, her older daughter, um, her older daughter, um, looks Eurasian as you would expect, but she has bright blue eyes because she, her, her mom obviously inherited the blue eye copy from her father who also had it. Now they both have brown eyes because it's recessive, but it was, it transmitted to her daughter. And so now you have a person that looks Eurasian with bright blue eyes. That's obviously not the norm, but it's because of the way the – basically, the blue eye gene never disappears. It's still there, right? And so that's that's the logic of what's going on. As people mix, they create new combinations. And this has happened in the past because that's – most human populations, like Australian Aborigines are, are, are one of the few exceptions of being totally pure descendants from first settlers. Most populations are a mix of different things that came together, uh, kind of like in Latin America. So what you see in Latin America is actually the typical – a process of what happened in most of the world we now know and it usually so is it true that yeah, some yeah. ethnicities are stronger than others like some are well, easier to that they dilute over time like that was a belief with the white colonizers in australia that they had like that the Aborigines had weak blood and they were like yeah, easy I mean, to. No, that's all kind of that's out. all kind of fake. A lot of that's fake right. because like the, the Europeans had like two ideas about this. Like one idea was like black blood was super strong, um, and they you know like Madison Grant and other people they had something called the law of reversion, which is like you revert to the lower type when the higher type crosses with the lower type, you always revert to the lower type. And yes, then the Australia obviously like they're just like making these things up based on what the ideological need is. I think the thing with Australians is. Um, I was having this discussion because this is like a very common idea um, and I've heard people promote it before uh, who are interested in like these sorts of topics like you. But uh, but um, I think the issue with Australian Aboriginals is they have distinctive features, but um, since their hair is not very curly. So like if someone's a fourth African, you can usually kind of tell, at least if you're American, because we're like keen to that, I think. Um, and the hair is usually curlier. Not always. There's some people that look totally white passing, but not, But a lot of the times you can tell. I think when someone's Australian Aboriginal and they're like a fourth Australian Aboriginal, I think what the argument is, they usually just look like more robust white people. Like they look like more robust Europeans. So, for example, um, like, you know, it just depends on how distinctive you look from another group. Right. So, I mean, uh, like, you know, I have I, mean, I think people know this, so just, I'll just say this. It's not like divulging doxing but i have three kids uh they ha they're varied in appearance but um uh you you couldn't i mean i have very generic physical features like there's some indian people who have like really deep set eyes or like that big like nose and all these i don't have any of that i'm just like i look like a very gen i i think of myself as a very generic looking human um if i i, I put myself through face filters i kind of look like georgian if i was white i don't know why but i kind of look like literally from the caucasus i you know I, I don't know why, but that's that's the yeah. You've I got like very round features that. That's what I'm trying to say. Quite white. Well, I don't know about white, ways. but I just I like feel like they're very fine. they're very generic. They're very, I just I feel mm. like I have very generic features. So um, what I'm getting at though is my kids like they're obviously a little darker. Like their mom is Northern European, 
Um, one of my sons has a very Nordic face, actually, and I know this because he looks like his great uncle Christian at the same age. So, look, if, if you look like a 100% Norwegian guy at the same age, you obviously have Norwegian features. So, you know, that, that I can tell. Also, he looks just like his maternal uncle. But my other kids, they, like, they're like they just generic featured like me, but they're lighter. And people just assume they're white because like there's nothing distinctive in their features. But they're half me. They're half brown. Like, that's just genetically true. But the people will just assume they're white because they have light skin and, you know, bra- like dark brown hair or brownish hair. And their features are super generic. Like, I don't have, like, epicanthic fold. I don't have, like, you know, my nose isn't super small or super big. You know, like, nothing like that. So um, I think I think when you're saying, like, they have, like, uh, weak genes, I think what they're saying is I did not say that. Or like whatever, like what you know, or like weak blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but this was yeah. in like in rabbit. This was in rabbit proof. Rabbit proof. Yeah, fence. lots of people. It was there. Believed were, that slash. Yeah, it, yeah, they were gonna breed it out. They were gonna breed it out. And it's just like I think what they're just saying is like Aboriginals are very distinctive looking, but they're not distinctive in a way that can't be masked by European ancestry. Yeah. Like African yeah. ancestry or East Asian ancestry, um, is very distinctive and it's harder to mask. So I know people like I have a friend. She's a fourth Japanese. And she has blonde hair and blue eyes. And most people just, you know, you kind of think she was white. But you look at her and she looks kind of Asian. And, like, people routinely are like, you look really Asian for some reason. She's like, yes, it's because I'm a fourth Japanese. She just has to explain to people. She's a fourth Japanese. So her features. And, like, um, I sometimes, like, I don't know what it is, but um, her mouth and her teeth, I never thought of them as Japanese. But I told her once that I was watching some news about, like, something in Japan. And a woman was being interviewed, and I saw the same mouth and teeth, the exact same mouth and teeth, right? So it's like, you know, there's – anyway, I, that, that's neither here nor there. My only point is I think when people say that, like, oh, the genes here are weak, what they're saying is the physical features of this race are not distinctive compared to my race, which is, like, in this case, European, right? Okay. Um, okay. Another question, like – We've already talked about uh, yeah, well, I, mean, I had nothing to contribute to that. Phrenology, all of it. Um, incest. Ugh. Someone on wait, the wait, weekend uh, was are you telling about me. The cult? Are you talking about that? Are you going to talk about the Colt family? Because you Australians are famous for that. The what family? The Colt family. Google the Colt family right now. Colt family, family Australia. Oh, the, the incest cult clan. The family. Uh, Colt. Yeah. It's like every second. That incest here. clan. But. My question is, like, on the weekend, someone was telling me, because I'm just always having conversations Cult, it's, about it's incest. It's a Wikipedia entry. Cold clan incest case. Australian family discovered in 2012 that have been engaging in four generations of incest. Um, oh, my God. They all lived on a I farm in Burawa, New South... I don't know what that is. New South Wales. Burawa. Yeah. Uh, not to be confused with Burawa. Okay. Burawa. Oh anyway, yeah. I mean I guess you're too young to know, but it was like a that it was a huge out. thing ten years ago. Wow. Okay, and what do you think about that? Should they should they have the right to do that? Well, I mean, so this is like okay, like this is like a I mean, have you asked Diana Fleischman this question? Because she's got strong opinions about stuff like this. <laughs> no, I'd love to. <laughs> but I guess my my like what we were talking about on the weekend is that yeah. it's a myth that incest necessarily produces like retardation sometimes it actually creates better like stronger genes no 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 no. i don't know who's saying that incest is not good not genetically not genetically um (laughs) that's the snippet i'm going to use incest is not good (laughs) i'm just saying i don't know who's saying that i think so they might have some like um maybe they like really like their cousin whoever's telling you this you know they're trying to like rationalize you know um, but, um, mm-hmm. so the cold family, they did a lot of like first degree incest. So first degree incest is, is a distinct thing where it's like taboo in almost all cultures, except for like in Royal families. So it's like brother, sister, parent, child, that sort of stuff is really messed up. Um, the cold family is well known. Uh, it's like a natural experiment, unfortunately. So the cold family mm-hmm. women, um, they had sex with their brothers a lot and also their father and also their grandfather. Um, and some of them are the products of, you know, parent-child incest, and then they had s- sex with their siblings. So they kept amplifying it it's up like each doubling. generation. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. So basically, Did they have a lot, lot of problems. Yeah, massive number. Like they a lot. So 
what I'm what I'm getting at is almost all of them had problems uh, in terms of like they looked fucked up, like their facial features are weird, mm. and their teeth are messed up. Bug. Yeah, 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 but uglier, like really wow. messed up. And, they, and the kids were all, ra- you know, the boys were raping all the girls and all this stuff. But um, what I'm pointing out, what I want to say is though, if you read the original stories, one of the girls, because they did genetic tests, one of the girls looked normal and recovered totally from all the because because they they were like they were living like um like Mowgli or something they were living in the wild and so a lot of the kids had problems like lice and all these or some stuff like that right and so but some of the kids like they could barely talk because their mouths and jaws were malformed and stuff and some of them were obviously retarded or dumb or slow um one of the girls though did really well and was basically functional and it was notable that she was the only one of her mom's children, I think, uh, who was clearly not an incest product. Like, so it was an outsider. And so that just shows you one generation of outbreeding, which is genetically true. Like, this is like a style of, one generation of outbreeding can mask all of these problems. Um, but incest is bad. Uh, and so, I mean, like, um, first degree incest causes massive issues. If you look at the, uh, the what is it, what was the case the Schlussel like uh, Austrian incest case a lot Fritzel. of them have heart pro- Schlussel yeah Fritzels a lot of those kids Fritzels. have heart problems and other things mm. I mean they're doing okay but they they have problems okay a lot several mm. of the kids died no this is not an evolutionary thing it's a genetic thing it's the, the way that the way that genetic inheritance works because like, let's say you have like uh let's say you have like five really bad genes that can cause problems but they're masked in you because it's recessive well if you have sex with your brother. He probably has like three of those. So right, you do the okay, math. So it just makes it. Yeah. You do three makes times three. That's independent kinda... probability. Like something's gonna mm. get exposed, and you get like a kid with two heads or something. Right. Like that, okay. okay. Now, and all of us have some bad genes. Almost everybody does. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why. I mean, in theory, there are people that don't. But like, you know, there's eight billion humans, right? Um, but most people have something that's really deleterious that's probably masked, and we just kind of know this because like sibling offsprings and like there's research on this they tend to be considerably more retarded shorter their fi- their reproductive fitness is lower so there's something called the british biobank um which is like a massive data it's like five hundred thousand individuals that have been genotyped mm-hmm. and the th- issue with the british biobank is this was like collected like decades ago and sampled decades ago before genotyping and so some of the some of the people in the biobank are clearly the products of first degree incest these were not known like you know th- they're not known but like they look at their genes, they're like these people are fucked up, and it, there's there's phenotypic evidence data on them. They tend to have way fewer children if they have children at all. Uh, they're way dumber, they're way shorter, all these things. The same is true of the offspring of first cousins. It's just not as extreme. So siblings are related one half, okay, uh, on average. First cousins are related one eighth, and so obviously all these risks are way way lower in first cousins, but they're still there. And so for like a lot of recessive diseases, a huge proportion of the people that have the disease uh, for rare recessive diseases are the product of cousin marriage. You know, so most people who are the product of cousin marriage will not have a horrible disease, but it could be that most people with certain horrible diseases are the product of cousin marriage. Okay, so this is like the fact that's out there. Also, I think the IQ drop is like five points from from what you would expect from the parents if they're if they're like if, if they are from like a normally outbred population, but they're cousins that are related in one way and so that's like a third of a standard deviation they're almost certainly like you know less attractive shorter all these things it's just not as strong of an effect it Hmm. on the individual level it's not a big deal probably i would say but on a societal level it's gonna have a drag okay and you know there are populations like in india with the caste system they don't marry their cousins but they're basically our cousins because everyone's related and a lot mm-hmm. of the issues with metabolic diseases and all these sorts of things are due to – and I have to like – Do Ashkenazi yeah. Jews have this issue? A little bit. With T-sacks a little and bit, stuff? Yeah. A little bit. Uh, it's not that bad. Um, they're actually not as – like they they went through a bottleneck, but they're not nearly as uh, hom- homogeneous as some Indian caste, for example, or Parsis. Sorry, Iona. Although that's her – she's only half, so it doesn't matter, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, – but so but Ashkenazi Jews are not actually – I mean they are a little bit uh, and they've been studied a lot for their diseases. But that's because they're like a homogenous you know, population. There's a lot of Jewish doctors. You know, it's just – it's a thing. Mm-hmm. But it's not – they're actually not that you know, inbred. 
which is what a lot of Jews say, like, oh, I'm inbred, but you know. What is your favorite ethnicity? I don't to have, study? You know, I don't, I don't have favorites. I love what all, is the most all God's interesting? children. Yeah. Oh, that's a I very like Cape, I like Cape Color. I like Cape Coloreds because they're descended from Indians, Malays. What's that? Khoisan. Cape Coloreds. Yeah. Google it. Cape Color. Cape, they're descended like from Cape Indi- York. Oh, sorry, Cape um, of Africa. South Africa. Yeah. yeah. Cape Town. Uh, yeah. They're the dominant. They're the dominant. They're the most numerous ethnic group in the Cape Colony. They're descended from Afrikaners. Uh, so what? Northern oh, Europeans. Khoisan, mm-hmm. um, Bantu, mm-hmm. Malays, and Indians. So they're a mix. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at them. They don't look like that distinct. Like they sort of just look like light skinned black people, like mixed. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they have variation, right? But. but South Africans, it's true that South Africans look very distinctly. So, sorry, black South That's Africans. Quite odd. That's quite odd ancestry mostly. Right. Like well, Mandela. So people like, people like Nelson Mandela. It's yeah. quite clear. Like he had Khoisan. Got, like I think small, his... small eyes, really high cheekbones. Yeah, yeah. and that's the Khoisan. Mm. That's the San, that's Khoi Khoi, Khoi ancestry. Um, and, and, you know, these are very, they're very genetically distinct from the Bantu people that came. Um, mm. So my, my friend, the late Henry Harpending, he did, uh, he did um, field work in, I think it was Botswana. And mm-hmm. um, so they have epicanthic folds, like the, mm-hmm. the eye, the, you know, like the East Asian eyes. Um, and yeah. so, um, so mono, mono lids. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. And so, um, uh, anyway, uh, you know, they don't call themselves Bushmen. Like they have, they have tribal names. And I think like the tribe he was like, uh, with was like, was like Zhu, you know, I'm just gonna say Zhu. I'm going to like avoid the click, but anyway, um, they had word for like, they had a word for white people. I forget what it was. It was probably just like white people in their dialect. They had a word for the Bantu, uh, and it was probably just a tribal name. Uh, I forget which one it is in, in – uh, but anyways, it was a Bantu tribe that was in Botswana. And then um, I think this was the 70s, and there were some Vietnamese um, – Vietnamese um, – I don't know if NGO is the right word, but this is during the communist time. And so they decided to like you know come like help out their fellow African brothers. And so the local Khoisan, like, these Bishman were just like, oh my god, they're just like us. And because like they're they're like brown, because because they're not very dark, the Bushmen are not very dark. They're brown. The Vietnamese are brown, and they got the same eyes. And so they were like they they said they they were like oh my god like they're Zhu like like you know but they don't speak the language of the, uh, you know they're like they're humans but they don't speak the language and so they were just getting confused because they were focused on the eyes because they had never seen they had never seen non Bushmen with eyes like that. Because, like, mm. you know, black Africans generally don't have those eyes. Europeans don't have those eyes. And so when they saw the Vietnamese, they were just like, oh, my God. You know, like they recognized, uh, you know, even though genetically the Vietnamese descend from out of Africa people. So, you know, it's, it's a convergent evolution. Um, it's just a characteristic that some populations have. Babies mm. have it. That's very interesting. Super cute, oh, you know. Babies have monolids. A lot of them do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, so a lot of babies. That's, that's why, why like, we look so different. Like I look at myself as a baby. I'm like, oh, I look so so different. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they have like you know more fat like around the cheeks. So they look a little Asian. Yeah. You know, a lot of babies look Asian. Cute, cute. And then Asian baby, like East Asian babies. Are just I don't want to get into it. I love babies. East Asian. I don't want to even talk about this because like I'm just They're like so super cute. pissed that China will not allow any more international adoption. So anyway, I don't want to um, get into it. So to finish up, why? is genealogy interesting and important and why should we not shy away from studying it and talking about it um well i mean like everyone's interested in their own history so first of all there's a personal angle you know um you know if you want to give like what you put on the grant application like it's important for disease you know uh, to know what your risks are so for example i'm south asian and uh you know bangladeshi bengali you know indian pakistani whatever um, it's pretty clear that, you know, as a race, we have a higher risk for heart disease, okay? And in the United States, I mean, in Australia, I think it's a little similar. Um, we are not a low socioeconomic status group. You know, like, we're actually, like, you know, brown people in America. Indian Americans are the richest ethnicity in the United States. Um, and, you know, if you go to a heart a – heart, I mean, whatever, man. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a member of a group. Okay, I'm special. But anyway, I'm going to uh, start calling you an oppressor. You're oppressing. I'm me. a con. What do you think? How do you think we got this name? Anyway, true. Khan um, means king, right? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Although it's just like it's a title in the Indian subcontinent. Um, but uh, basically, um, this is obviously a genetic issue, right? Like, obviously a genetic issue. And, like, you know, all this stuff about, like, oh, well, maybe they're oppressed and discriminated against. No. Like, we have heart disease in the Indian subcontinent. We have heart disease in Britain. We have heart disease in the U.S. We have heart disease everywhere. All that's common is our genes, you know? Like, uh, the cultures are changing. The values are changing. In the Indian subcontinent, we're not discriminating against ourselves because we are ourselves, you know? Um, In Britain, people are eating fish and chips and getting drunk. In the U.S., they're trying to, like, do the grind mentality in Silicon Valley. Like, all these different, like, lifestyles. And yet everyone gets heart disease, right? So the disease uh, thing is interesting. British people are eating fish and chips. Oh, I don't, I don't That's know, racist. man. That's racist. I mean. How can they eat when their teeth are all <laughs> messed up? No, I mean, I don't even I mean, I feel like I feel like we should annex England. I mean, I've said this in public before. We should turn them into a protectorate uh, because they're just, like, their government is messed up. Um, they speak English, like they could do like a lot of housework and we could communicate with them. We should give them like they work visas to the tea. US. Well, also like, I would <laughs> love to like live in England, London. I would like to live in England during the summer. Cause I can remote work. I can like leave Austin and go to England for the summer and then come back. It'd be so easy. And you know, mm. the British people, they need jobs. They can come to the U S and like do our yard work or something, you know? Um, <laughs> They would make more money. They would make more money doing yard work than doing whatever like crappy job they're doing there. Like unless no, seriously, I'm not joking. I am not joking. They don't make any money unless you're a banker there. Like yeah, the bankers lawyers, make money. Aussie lawyers go there because they make more money than here, which is saying something because people make a lot of money here. Yeah, Australia has yeah, but like you guys are just like it's. I mean, we not everyone has your mineral resources, you know. So I mean, you know, someday the Chinese mm. demand might might dry up. You know, yeah. Oh my god. But I mean, the other, the other, the other, the other issue is uh, I think, um, you know, in terms of like human history, the human past broadly, I think it's super interesting to to kind of know about uh, where people came from. I mean, I think, for example, it is it is a cool fact that everybody else. I mean, because when I tell people, they seem pretty amazed by it. Everybody outside of Africa, literally everybody, is descended from one hundred to a thousand people. Like one tribe that left 60,000 years ago. Everybody. So when you look at the genealogy, it all collapses back to that, you know? Or, you know. Um, the, those are haplogroups, right? Like I descended well, ha- from one. Well, ha- haplogroups haplogroups you know. are, are usually associated with the paternal and maternal lineage. But yes, mm. it, it, what, what, is, what I just said there is also true of the haplogroups. Mm. Like all of the non Africans are branched in one branch. So that's a cool fact, right? Um, in terms of Africa, I mean, you know, there's deep structure in different areas. Um, you know, you learn interesting facts like the, you know, the pop, the San Bushmen, because they live, because the Khoisan people lived where they lived, uh, and they're the first people to split out from other human populations. They actually have the most genetic diversity of any human population. So two different random people uh, from the same tribe. This is a fact. You look at the whole genome and you do a one-to-one comparison, gene to gene to gene. Actually, base pair to base pair, uh, nucleotide diversity type statistics for the geneticists out there. Um, And you compare it between Chinese and Northern European, and they'll have more within the tribe. Because, like, they they didn't lose their diversity out of Africa, and other Africans went through more bottlenecks for various reasons. And so I think, I mean, these are interesting facts, aside from, well, what is, like, the disease risk or whatever. And you know what? If we ever have to send... um, send like 1000 people into space because there's a massive asteroid that's going to destroy our life on earth. You know, you got to talk to geneticists to figure out who to send. Really what you should mm. just do is send a Cape colored village. Cause they have mm. most of the genetic diversity of the human race. I mean, wow. Cape, you should send, you should send 900 Cape colors and 950 Cape colors and 50 Australian Aboriginals. So then you got it covered. Okay. I mean, I've actually given it some thought cause I was like, which population is underrepresented in the genetic diversity of the Cape Colors? And it, 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 is, it is Melanesians because they have East Asian ancestry. They have South Asian ancestry. They have European ancestry. They have San ancestry. They have Bantu ancestry. Um, and, uh, you know, the Huguenots from southern France probably bring some Mediterranean ancestry. There's actually like some So they're Jewish... the most mixed people. 
that I can think of off the top of my head, yes. Mm. They also also some Lithuanian Jews intermarried with them, so they have Middle Eastern ancestry from the Litvaks that went to South Africa. Wow. There are Cape really colors that have Litvak ancestry. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, Razib, I have to go. All right. It was nice talking to you. We could talk about this for hours. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining me on the Quillette Cetera podcast, and I hope to see you again soon. All right. All right. Cool.